Democrat Institute, and I always like to point out how vast the African continent is. So it's impossible to uh, show all the cultures and all the art production. Um, and indeed, in the 20s, uh, uh, one of the early books published on African art called Primitive Negro Sculpture uh, showed the region that the authors considered to be artistic. And that was West Africa, called the, the Sudan in, in, in that time. Uh, West Africa and Central Africa, so countries like Mali and Nigeria, Cameroon and the, the Congo were uh, considered productive in art, and all the rest was left out. And in the reinstallations, we wanted to um, offer a larger view of African art. Uh, to begin with, of uh, Egyptian, ancient Egyptian art. And when I arrived at MIA uh, seven and a half years ago, the Egyptian art was curated by my colleague in Chinese art. Uh, for some reason, ancient Egypt was considered to be on a par with classical China and not part of Africa. So I reclaimed in ancient Egyptian art, which is now mixed with what is called sub-Saharan art in the galleries. And in clockwise, you have Christian, Jewish, and Muslim art from Africa, um, from Ethiopia, the diptych, and we'll say a little more about that. The ivory figure in the middle is Saint Anthony, uh, made by a, a Congo artist from, from the country, the, the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, the Congo ethnic group was visited by Portuguese missionaries in the 16th, 15th century and kind of copied the uh, iconography that the missionaries introduced. And this St. Anthony figure, in fact, St. Anthony himself became, uh, was recuperated by the Congo people and became a local saint that, that was used for healing and, and prosperity. Um, and then the two, uh, the pair of uh, Rinominim, which are finials of Torah, they were, were produced by a Moroccan uh, smith, and they have this very old Jewish diaspora in Morocco, which started uh, more than 2,000 years ago. Uh, there are still some synagogues. The largest community of Jews in Morocco lives in Casablanca. Um, and many of them left in, in the past 50 years. But so uh, this is African art, um, Moroccan art uh, in, in the com made in the context of the Jewish faith. And then the two um, items on the bottom are related to Muslim faith. There's the Quranic board, uh, used all over Africa, and kind of an African invention, um, where young students learn verses of the Quran, but also to write Arabic. And sometimes these boards are used as diplomas when a student has uh, finished his uh, Quranic school. Sometimes they are used in healing, where particular sutras will be written on the board and then washed off to, uh, and then consumed by a, by a person to have an healing effect. And this is a very rare uh, Quranic board where there is some figurative uh, depiction of, of uh, a camel, but it's integrated in the writing, uh, in the calligraphy. And in the middle, there is this uh, uniform of a Mahdi soldier the Mahdi was the, the guided one, literally, in Arabic. Um, the the Mahdi-led uh, movement against the British colon colonizers in the country of Sudan and uh, in the 19th century, and their uniforms were inspired by dervish um, clothing. And that's what this patchwork means. So all these items are at the MIA, and I wanted to integrate them into the African art galleries. And also, finally, uh, we, we wanted to show how African ideas and imagery left the continent through the diaspora. Uh, on, on the right, you have a, a flag used in, in Haiti, in the Wudun religion. Uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful example of syncretism. Uh, Maria Dolor Dolorosa uh, has been covered with sequins and has been rebaptized Erzuli, which is also the name of a spirit in 
West Africa, Water Spirit, and to make this flag. And uh, on the left, there's a, a recently acquired work by a, an African American artist, Renee Stout, who harks back to uh, imagery and color colors uh, from the Congo people. And so the, this work is called a Crossroad Marker, and it used, uses the colors of white and red, which are typical in Congo art. And the cross itself uh, symbolizes the meeting point between the world of the living and the world of the dead. So um, again, uh, an example of ideas of Africa that have gone and inspired artists abroad. Indeed, the, the, in the intention of the emphasis on motion, movement, and journey is to emphasize that materials have traveled and ideas and iconography and also artists. And, um, and finally, the movement of the visitors was also uh, inspired the reinstallation of the galleries. So here is a picture of the old galleries with all the art in uh, wall vitrines. Um, and you can't see very well that there's a, a mask at the end. But it's not the end. It's, in fact, the beginning of another gallery. But there was a, a false wall in between. And all these partitions were made to uh, hide certain pillars that are in the room. And so with the uh, local firm of architects, VJAA, we completely opened up the space. And they used these pillars, in fact, as the backbone of very tall vitrines that uh, show masks. And um, I will give an example of that in a second. Um, the purpose of the reinstallation was to make the art more accessible. And so here are a few views of the, uh, the opening in 2013. Many more pieces in the middle, in the open on platforms, fewer pieces in, um, in vitrines, and, um, and the emphasis both on ritual art, but then also what I call design, and that's in the bottom right corner, uh, a gallery dedicated to textiles and ceramics, which, uh, which shows the enormous richness and variety, and also mixes in contemporary art, as you can see, the black pot on the right is by Magdalene Odundo, who is a Kenyan artist who lives in England, and I will talk a bit more about that too. And please interrupt me if there is a, if there's any question or remark you would like to make. Um, and so the space is open, and then an important um, factor is also technology. So here, for instance, are four displays of masks in various museums. The one on the left, the top left, uh, was the Minneapolis Institute of Art when I arrived there. It was a mixture of masks and of statuary, and it was not so clear what the viewer was supposed to, to learn or to take away from it. And then on, on, on its right is um, an even more complicated vitrine, which is in, at the American Museum of Natural History. Uh, where you are bombarded with these masks. Um, underneath is kind of an open uh, display at the Detroit Institute of Art. And on the left is the Fowler Museum, uh, where next to masks are the screens, as you can see, in the gallery, which show a masquerade. We, we didn't want to burden, or we didn't want to inv invade the space with uh, information with posters or videos and so this is kind of a very clean display with, that the architects developed and you can see the spine of masks throughout the galleries with one or two masks in, that are highlighted and the interesting thing is that these vitrines invite the viewer to walk around so we cannot move the masks but masks are, are dynamic forms of art and so we invite the viewer to look at the masks from various angles and therefore create some kind of multiple perspectives. But then the technology, as I said, is an important factor. We have a, a touch map, no, a touch screen map um, that you see on the top right um, where various art stories are being told. Um, we have an interactive study table 
this for, for the time being dedicated to gold weights from Ghana, inviting for children. And then we have iPads um, in, the, in the galleries that have, uh, and this is a, a screenshot where particular items can be looked at in more detail and also where performances with the art and with some masks are, uh, are shown. So that's, and the labels are fairly liminal, minimal and are always on the walls. We didn't put any labels inside of the vitrines in order to be able to focus on the art. So this technology uh, or these stories told on the iPads also include a, an element of self-reflection and, and that too is, the, is implied in the title of uh, Material Journeys. How did the art arrive from Africa to the West? And, um, and sometimes it, that is problematic and I will um, talk a little more about the Kingdom of Benin which um, is in the current, uh, the, the contemporary country of Ni the Republic of Nigeria. Um, it was known by the Portuguese already, the Kingdom of Benin, and uh, an old uh, book, in, first written in Dutch by Alfred Dopper, um, draws the, the, Dopper himself never visited uh, Africa, but he drew uh, from sources and both published and, and oral sources, and so here you have a, a display of the, the procession of the King of Benin. Now, um, the Kingdom of uh, Benin produced court art, of which there are three examples here. Um, there is a, a memorial head of a deceased king, there's a tusk that, that tells a kind of a genealogy of a certain section of Benin history, so it's, it's a record of, of history, and then there's a, a leopard, which is a, a vessel, a hewer. And um, if one wants to see how this was being used, um, there is a, a famous photograph made in the 50s with these altars dedicated to uh, past kings, and one can see uh, the several tasks uh, tusks, excuse me, and some heads and bells that were used in, in commemorating these ancestors. Um, however, the, the objects that you see in the 1950 photograph are not from the 16th, 17th, 18th century or 19th century. They are all were all made in the 20th century. The reason is that in 1897 there was uh, an infamous British punitive expedition. Um, directed against the king of Benin, the Oba of Benin. And um, the British bombarded the city of Benin for a week and then entered the palace and took all the art that was there. And you see the tusks, uh, statues, you even see a, a leopard. Um, and it was shipped to Britain, sold by the uh, State Department. Um, <coughs> To finance, to finance the expedition, and then the British Museum got a lot, and then it was sold to other museums, and that's how it, uh, it's all over the world. And so, also on this iPad in the new, in, in the new installation, is a short interview with uh, an art historian from Nigeria, Sylvester Opiece, who um, a few years ago, before the reinstallation, talked about the problem of the looted art from Benin. And uh, although he, he, did, he did not uh, adv advocate for a complete repatriation of all Benin art, that would be impossible. That Benin has, sorry, uh, the kingdom of Benin art because Nigeria doesn't have enough museums to house them. He still uh, thought that museums in the West should make it clear that this was in fact looted art and property from the Kingdom of Benin and also make an effort, museums in the West, to make an effort to work together with uh, art historians, with uh, visitors, with youth in, in Nigeria itself in order to present the art that is on view here. There's no ancient art left, uh, Benin art left in Nigeria. 
And so, um, art in movement, uh, and I owe these and the, the, the following slides to my colleague that Vicky also mentioned, Alex Bortelot. Um, he made a, a map story and traced the origin of the leopard water vessel. And the origin, first how the, this type of object arrived in Africa. So originally, ewers were made in Iran, in the Muslim world, and they traveled to Spain and Northern Europe, objects like that, between 900 and 1500. And then um, the Portuguese took an example of such a ewer to Benin when they arrived there at the end of the 15th century, but also traded with, uh, the, uh, with the traders in the, the Benin Kingdom with massive, or traded, or imported massive amounts of copper. And so there's, there was suddenly a new material available to uh, brass and copper to these artists in, in Nigeria. And then this particular leopard that is now in Minneapolis was part of the loot of the British and got to London in 1897. These ewers always come in pairs, so a pair of these was given to the Emperor of Germany, Wilhelm II, who gave it to his doctor in the 20th century. And then the doctor eventually gave the pair of uh, leopards to the Munich Museum, uh, Museum of Ethnography. And the director in that museum in 57 decided, well, we have two identical leopards, we will sell one. Of course, they come in pairs. But, um, and so he, uh, through a dealer in Switzerland, finally the Minneapolis Institute of Art acquired it in 1958. So a, a long history, uh, both of the iconography, the materials, and the work of art itself. Um, and Benin art is still uh, often in the news. Um, there is this example of a ivory pendant mask from the 16th century on the left that was offered for sale by Sotheby's in 2013. And uh, it's almost identical to one in the British Museum. And there may be a third such ivory mask in, in Seattle at the Seattle Art Museum. A very rare, very I I iconic art of work and uh, work of art. And there was such a protest in 2013, both by uh, Western scholars and also especially by the Nigerian government that uh, the Sotheby's withdrew its sales. So the, 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 the auction didn't uh, take place. But it was probably uh, sold privately anyways. Um, and here is um, a copy of the mask that's at the British Museum, made in 1977. And, and I invite you to read this little text. It was made for um, uh, an art festival. And the British Museum would not lend its own mask, uh, maybe for fear that it would not come back. And so uh, the Nigerian ivory carver made a copy. But um, it underlines, again, the, the discrepancy between the holdings in, in Western museums and, and what's going on in Nigeria. And indeed, uh, there are very few exhibitions organized of African art, organized uh, by Western museums, especially archaeological art, that travel to the south. And one very important um, exception is this, this major exhibition uh, on the Niger, Niger Valleys that was organized in 1993 by a uh, French museum uh, that no longer exists. It exists, it's not part of the Musée du Cap Henri. Um, and it traveled, as you can see from the list, it traveled uh, <coughs> both to the United States, but also to various museums in uh, West African countries and had enormous success. Um, but that's really an exception. 
often such exhibitions do not travel in the South. Um, and in fact, many museums today would no longer be able to access or acquire archaeological pieces because um, ICOM, the International Committee of Museums, which is a world organization, in, um, in the late 90s published, I'm sorry, published a, a list of archaeological objects that are protected by law. So um, there have been efforts in various countries, especially Mali and Nigeria, to um, protect their cultural heritage, which can no longer leave the country without all kinds of paperwork. And so, uh, as you can see from this, this mosaic photograph, there are various uh, items that are part of that list, including Nok artworks that come from Nigeria and Jenny figures, uh, the Jenny culture in, in Mali, which is part of this Niger Valley thing. And so it was very interesting that uh, the Louvre opened uh, a section of the museum dedicated to non Western art that was in 2000. Um, beautifully installed, and on view was among other things, this knock figure, which is quite exceptional. Um, and it was there without any further, uh, it, it had been acquired the year before, and it was there without any further explanation. Again, there was an outcry in the French press that, that the museum would show art that was not supposed to leave the country. And so, uh, in 2003, the, the label had a, a little appendix which said that it was uh, on loan from the uh, Federal Republic of Nigeria, on the Pope. So, um, acknowledging that in fact the Louvre couldn't own it because that red list had been published well before 2000. I will uh, finish with a few more uh, <coughs> examples of what I call South South exchanges. Of course, there's, uh, there are the famous Trans Saharan trade routes that connect uh, Northern Africa with the Gulf of Guinea, but also Western Africa with uh, Egypt and, and uh, Saudi Arabia, with, through the pilgrimage to Mecca. And a famous king from Mali, uh, Musa Keita I, is depicted on this uh, map uh, that is, uh, was made in Spain. And he, he holds a, a piece of gold in his hand. And he, uh, the, the king, he was king of the kingdom of Bin, of Jenne, excuse me, uh, in contemporary Mali. In fact, his kingdom is much larger than the country of Mali. And when he went to Cairo on the, on the Hajj, he brought with him so much gold that in, that he sold in in Cairo. Uh, I mean, on his way to Mecca, he stopped in Cairo and sold so much gold that the value of gold was uh, collapsed around, uh, around 1300. And uh, I looked up, there's a, a list of the most rich, most rich people in history, which was uh, produced also looking at the past and kind of retroactively. Um, the Celebrity Net Worths list, it's called, and Mansa Musa is number one. And uh, Bill Gates is only number 12, and, uh, and Mr. Trump is not on the list, of course. <laughs> um, so this was a very important kingdom uh, that was visited by uh, Arab travelers, and Ibn Battuta wrote about uh, it, and so that's certainly part of the, the, the kings of Jenea also invited architects from the Arab world to uh, build mosques, and so they, they, it became a center for Islamic studies in the Middle Ages. <clears throat> Another example, very different from Central Africa, is this royal belt from the Kuba people. Um, the Kuba live in the center of the <coughs> continent, and the interesting thing is that this belt incorporates shells from both the Atlantic and the Indian Ocean, which indicates how much exchanges there were. It's a 19th century belt. 
um, how much uh, exchanges there were and shells were part of the, of the inner African, Central African trade routes. Um, I, I talked about Ethiopian Christianity, um, and so there is this diptych that's that one could call in Italian style, and I'll explain in a minute why. Another diptych that is from Ethiopia that is not in our collection, but that's at the Harn Museum, shown shows clearly that the, um, that at the court of Ethiopia there were also artists from from India, since uh, this is. Uh, a diptych, a Christian diptych, uh, that clearly shows uh, influences from Mogu uh, artists. And so why do we call this Italian? Because the Madonna on Ethiopian diptychs and or icons, since very early on, follow a model that was disseminated in Ethiopia by missionaries again in the probably 15th, 16th century of a, a was uh, an engraving of this icon that's in Rome, in the Basilica di Santa Maggiore, Maria Maggiore. And there are all kinds of details that Ethiopian artists took from this icon, including, uh, it's not so clear on the reproduction of the icon, but M Maria holds in her left hand a piece of cloth, and on all Ethiopian icons that is also reproduced. And so. Mm, that's kind of the canon of Christian art in Ethiopia. Ethiopia uh, has some archaeological work, but it's especially monasteries that hold libraries and icons, and there too there is a danger of, of looting and of in illegally exporting those riches. And um, a famous French specialist of Ethiopian art, Jacques Mercier, visited all kinds of monasteries in the 90s, uh, 80s and 90s to inventorize the, the belongings, especially because there were, uh, there were wars between Ethiopia and uh, Eritrea, and between Ethiopia and Tigray, and so a lot of art was uh, being illegally uh, uh, looted. And I will end with uh, Magdalene Udundo. Um, who, uh, who was born in 1950, who still makes uh, ceramics. It's all handmade, she doesn't use a wheel, and it's inspired by African shapes, uh, but she doesn't give any titles to her work. And the one on the left is interesting because um, it is inspired by ceramics from Congo, from the Mangbetu people, uh, who the women had this, uh, no longer today, but at the end of the 19th century and for the first decade of the 20th century, this flaring hairdo, which then was also could be seen on, on, the, on the pots, on the vessels. But there's another layer to this story, because the Mangbetu originally did not make figurative pottery. Um, on the right, well, first to situate the Mangbetu, they are kind of uh, they were hard to reach, and uh, European ex uh, explorers reached the Mangbetu country by following the Nile, uh, and then other uh, explorers came uh, through the Congo River Valley. Um, and so at the end of the 20th century, suddenly there were lots of Europeans in Mangbetu land. And the first one who visited them came there in the 70s and published their art, in, and that's what you see on top right, in 1875, and there is no figurative pot at all. Very complicated shapes, but no human uh, head. And a few uh, decades later, in 1912, uh, another visitor saw all kinds of figurative pots, including the one that uh, we showed show here. So, in other words, the Mangbetu invented a new art form because Europeans liked to, take, to buy souvenirs and uh, like to have something figurative and thought that these uh, hairdos looked very cute. And so it, they created a market. And so uh, Magdalene Udundo, <coughs> in fact, is inspired by a new tradition that uh, originated at the beginning of the 20th century among the Magbeto. And the last slide, um, well, here you see, interestingly enough, that 
uh, ceramics in Mang Betu country is a uh, work of women. Traditionally, it's women who make pots. And um, as is often the case in, in various societies, uh, once it becomes commercially made, it's men who take over. It becomes uh, uh, kind of an industrially made item that then uh, is marketed. Uh, the very final slide shows uh, another kind of movement, namely this young girl being stopped in her tracks, looking at uh, a photograph by the Kenyan, uh, by, by the Nigerian photographer Ojikere that we acquired a few years ago. And um, kind of the, the hope of the entire, entire installation is that people interact with, with the art. Thank you very much. open up questions um, from the audience. We have that for my 15, 20 minutes dialogue. <coughs> to project this African art uh, in a little different context. And I'm wondering if there's also uh, an institutional turn towards more programming, more events that would welcome visitors in for the purpose of discussing about that, or indeed amplifying maybe other cultural movements and projects in the city of black people or African movements as well. Uh, that's a very good question. And um, it's certainly uh, something that person first interests me personally, and, and secondly, that we are also trying to achieve. Um, we had, for instance, a Somali artist of the spoken word called Abdi Phenomeno, um, who did a performance in the galleries. Um, in fact, it was an event where there were three artists were invent, uh, invited. Um, one was a Hmong uh, poet who did something in the galleries where there's some Hmong work, a contemporary work. And then uh, Abdi Phenomeno, uh, we moved to the African gallery and uh, next to some Somali art with his performance. So it's certainly something that uh, we, we tried to achieve. Um, and, and as, as um, Dr. Said knows also there is a Somali art, culture and artifact museum in Minnesota, on Lake Street. And um, at MIA, we also try to do things with them. So that's one example. If it's done more, more widely in the entire museum, uh, um, I think that's certainly one of the ambitions, yes, to make the museum more accessible to large populations of um, immigrants who for whom it's not really the first place they would go to. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you, uh, you started with, by referencing uh, Robert Ferris Thompson's African Art Motion. One of the things that his work has done over the years was a lot of cross cultural comparisons that we right. have with the African and so forth. So, in terms of you know, your plans for the gallery space here, to what extent are you going to try to follow that kind of motion of African art, again, across the transatlantic and its uh, survivals and mutations and so forth in new world contexts. Again, that's uh, something I would love to, to be able to do. Our collection is not very rich for the moment, so I certainly want to acquire more Caribbean art and art from Brazil, where, which show examples of um, clear influences, for instance, like from the Yoruba people. Uh, and so, yeah, it's an ambition. It's it's harder to find work on, on on the market that would fill those gaps, but that's certainly yes, the, the plan. Yeah. 
mean, Thompson, Thompson's book we use routinely in, in African American uh, studies courses. Um, that should we fair. focus on the diaspora, flash of the spirit, yep. you know, in particular. Mm -hmm. um, and so those you know, we're interested again in this whole matter about the about survivals and adaptations of forms and that body of work has been really important. It, it is very important, and and uh, I also thought about it even if it's not possible to acquire those pieces for the, the galleries themselves, it might be possible to do a small installation or a small exhibition that deals with those problems, those issues and, and those celebrations. Yeah. In fact, there's a project now about the, <coughs> the, the period rooms. So the period rooms are these recreations of settings from, there are a few examples from the 16th and 17th century, I think, then there's a French period room uh, from a kind of a castle. And one of them is the Charleston room that belonged to uh, John Stewart at the end of the 18th century. And he was an envoy of the British to deal with Native Americans. But he also had rice fields with enslaved Africans. And so, in, so far in the period room is all about Mr. Stewart. But uh, in our new project, and that new installation will open at the end of this year, of the calendar year, we also want to give voice to Native Americans and to Africans or African Americans. And so one of the things that we did that we thought about for the African part um, was to concentrate on rice and rice cultivation. And we show, for instance, we'll show some objects from West Africa that are much newer than the end of the 18th century, but that kind of uh, show how rice cultivation is celebrated in those, still today, in those cultures. Uh, for instance, a woman among the Dan people, a woman who excels in rice cultivation and who is also very hospitable and generous with her, with her crops, gets a beautifully carved spoon, a ladle that's not being used in the kitchen, but that is a, a dance. She dances with the spoon, and it's a sign of her status as an exceptional woman in that society. But it's all based on rice cultivation. And um, we also want to include a testimony from a Senegalese chef who lives in New York and who uh, explains how a lot of cuisine today in the Carolinas, but also more generally in, in America, is in fact inspired by West African uh, gastronomy. At it from the time of the enslaved Africans. So those are small examples, but we... we, we and if you have uh, ideas for, for uh, anything that would show the link and the... Uh, well, one of the, you know, one of the things, because is the idea that for the Mancala exhibition right. that we've talked about for the last couple of years is another way of, yep. of showing the, uh, you know, the transport of African art African art in motion, right. and trans oceanically over time. Sure. It's, a, it's a different aspect of culture, the, the world of, of African games mm -hmm. and recreation. And there aren't, there haven't been very many exhibits on that dimension of African art making that I'm aware of beyond Alexander de Vuk's mm -hmm. exhibit at the British Museum, you know, 20 some years ago. Oh, yeah. So we, we could make a, a mark if in fact <clears throat> that comes to pass. Uh, we will look into it again, yes. That, that project was kind of put on the back burner because the, the owner of this collection of Mancala, Mancala are these boards with holes, two or three or four rows, which is kind of an African chess that you find in, in West Africa and East Africa and also in Asia, India and Indonesia. And, and, and as you pointed out, also in the Caribs, so Caribbean.
that exhibition, unfortunately, is kind of put on a hold because the, the collector of those boards has given it to a, a museum, but that museum is not Mia, so I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> Um, I have a more consensual kind of question, but I'll, I'll stretch it out so you can, can have a couple of hours. Um, one of the common misconceptions of Africa is that Africa is a country, yeah, as opposed to like a host of different countries. And you know, you were speaking about like how the space within the museum got reconfigured. Yeah? It, I think the word you used was opening it up, um, and you kind of justified it through you know the, um, visitors then can have this multi kind of like perspective kind of look at what is going on. Um, but what I was wondering is, you know, this opening up of the space, and so people can kind of, you know, go through it in whichever way, does that not reinforce this notion of Africa being an entity? If you go to other parts of Mia, I mean, you don't get the Asian part. You know, you get China, you get Japan, you get, you know. Um, there, there's absolutely a way in which that part of the world, the, the Asian or Asia, is demarcated in a way that people can't think of Asia as a country. And I'm asking you rhetorically when you guys decided to open up the space in the manner that you explained earlier with the architects, is that not buying straight back into that, that discourse where people can kind of just, you know, walk and it's still Africa and you don't have to think about heterogeneity, you don't have to think about different cultures. I mean, if I think about some of the displays I've seen, you have mosques from, you know, West Africa under the same display case as something from East Africa, as if these cultures are the same, you know. Um, and when you were thinking about how you were going to do, what you were going to do with the space, was this one of the things that was part and parcel of the conversation as the curator? Hmm. It's a very legitimate criticism. Hmm. There are some geographic sections in the museum, like art from Southeast Asia as one gallery, um, or maybe two adjacent galleries. Um, Africa has indeed three galleries. Um, Native America, although that's not really geographical, has also three galleries. And I, I agree with you. Um, it's certainly not ideal. And so what we have tried to do also in the in the didactics, most of which are on these iPads and on the map, is to show that indeed Africa is not one country and that there's huge diversity. Um, the same is true for the Oceanic Art Gallery. I mean, Oceania covers one third of the, of the globe, or more or less. So it's not possible to do justice to the diversity and to the specificity of different cultures or regions I agree. Um, the fact that in, at MIA we have a number of galleries just for China, a number of galleries just for Japan, is also part of the history of the institution, that there were donors who, who gave Chinese art for decades, and that's why it has become such a huge collection. So if we had, I don't know, 15 galleries and 10,000 objects, we would be able to make it more specific and, and, and convey the, the, the message that Africa indeed is not one country. Yeah. But it's a danger uh, uh, that's, that we do it now. Yes.
kind of shared history of expropriation of art that cuts across a number of points in the global south might, might offer a possibility for some kind of comparative work across exhibitions or galleries. I'm thinking about the looting of the Forbidden City in Beijing in almost the same period as the looting of Benin, and whether that might be a way of, a different kind of way of bringing up, uh, in this case, present day Nigeria into conversation. China. Um, so that's also another question: uh, how that, how that kind of comparison, perhaps following in a different vein from uh, the question John posed earlier about uh, thicker connections between uh, African continental arts and those of the African diaspora. This is a different kind of lateral transcontinental connection. Uh, there would also be uh, intra-African comparisons given the heated debate about the expropriation of the Nefertiti, the Nefertiti bus, and the, the demand for repatriation uh, by uh, some in the Egyptian art community, uh, and also activism and protests around that issue in Berlin, say, over the last few years, so there are possibilities there, too. And then I guess the last kind of related question is really stemming from what we're going to do as well, is, um, I would be really interested in whether Mia is, is working with Nigerian museums, for instance, on the kinds of initiatives that Sylvester Gucci outlined in the lecture that you, that you uh, lost in 2012. Um, and what more can be done to uh, perhaps, uh, if, if the art cannot be repatriated in certain cases to Nigerian museums, whether visiting traveling exhibitions might not be organized, exchanges among museum colleagues and curators, artists in Nigeria, and as you said, you know, uh, younger scholars and youth too. So I, I'd be interested in some of the concrete efforts uh, that Mia might be making or considering making on this front and on other related issues. That's such an important part of the, uh, of the story, perhaps, of why objects from certain areas and not enough of others, and why we have uh, perhaps a situation that Virgil described, which galleries concatenating all kinds of different African contexts in a single um, continent. Okay. Um, well, I mean, the, 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 the larger answer to all three questions is that Mia has a lot more to do, and I'm totally aware of that. Um, uh, there is no, to, to my, to my knowledge, there is no museum-wide comparison of similar situations where art left the country under suspicious uh, circumstances, and I'm sure. It, it could be done more widely. We, um, I mean, even including classical Greece and and Rome and things like that. We we did return a léger painting recently because it uh, it turned out that it had belonged to a Jewish family and was part of the Nazi uh, looting of Jewish collections. And, uh, and one of the things that Sylvester, I don't know if it's still in the video, but at least uh, in our conversations he talked about it, the, this Nigerian art historian. Um, one of the problems is that there is no legal framework between uh, concerning Nigerian art. And that makes it very difficult because uh, museums or auction houses, who of course want to keep their art, uh, ask who 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 is the legal who are the legal owners of this uh, court art? Uh, is it uh, is it the descendants of the king of Benin? Is it is it the, the state? I mean uh, the province of of this particular region in Nigeria? Is it all Nigerian people? Etc. Etc. 
So there's a legal framework uh, for uh, Nazi outcomes. So, um, but then that ties to your third question. So the first question, indeed, uh, we talk about that in the didactics. <coughs> That's how it's being presented. Or if I give a tour, then I also emphasize it. Um, but so we have started a conversation through Sylvester with uh, a Nigerian museum, but it's going extremely slow. And, uh, and sometimes, yeah, there's no follow-up. So it, it's not very active, I would say. Um, but one could think of such exchanges with many other countries, which, and that's still not happening. May I add to that part about uh, connections with African museums? Uh, Ibrahim Chow, who is a, a major archaeologist in Senegal, mm -hmm. also was, I think, may still be the curator of the African Art Museum in Dakar, which regionally is very, very important and wonderful. He was here in the Afro Department and with anthropology in 2004 as a Fulbright Fellow. And is, and is in and out. He was here about a year ago, we visited. So that would be another contact. And he uh, did his studies in the US, his grad studies at uh, Rice University. So that would be, I think, a very fruitful path that one could pursue. Definitely. And which brings in the Francophone yes. connection, which we are lacking, and risk <coughs> lacking more, even more down the road at this university. Um, which I would like to see fall out of the picture for me. Yes, and the, and the project that, um, that Vicky mentioned, where also with, with Saeed, where we, <coughs> we um, assembled a set of Somali works of art that are in various Western museums. <coughs> and we had pictures of them. And with that material, young Somali students worked in order to um, to get testimonies about those objects from their elders. So that's not a cooperation between MIA and, and the state of Somalia, but it certainly helps the Somali community here to kind of and and and, and uh, uh, of course it also benefits MIA to have uh, valuable information about works. Through oral, oral traditions. Can I just have two sentences in the crowding local market of art production and patron of the purchase in Nigeria? And how does it connect so well to, say, the institutional culture, the museum culture? Uh, I was struck by uh, the remarking of the H about the lack of capacity of museums, right. the support purported lack of capacity of museums that are to house. But there might also be connections you know, through, through artists uh, mm -hmm. themselves, including some of scholars in the U.S. I think there's one like Pardon me? for instance, who would be there at the University of Connecticut. I don't know him. Others who were active in the Nigerian art scene, and the contacts were key. Following on Vicky's um, comment about uh, her connection with Senegal. Question. I know some, some students have to leave, so thank you again for coming and um, appreciate your participation. Thank you again. Feel free to grab food when you. Um, <laughs>